first speaker is Casper, Casper Bogan, who is uh, a, a former senior member of Microsoft. Well, I think you were chief privacy officer at one point, weren't you, Casper? Not officer. That means I was compliance, which I was okay. advising. Advisor, advisor. Okay. So, uh, and he's got a small deck of uh, slides that he's going to take us through the chronology of these bewildering new, this bewildering new world of big data and surveillance. How's that? Okay, good. So it was about average introduction, but I'll let him do the work. Uh, well, <coughs> let me repeat thanks to uh, Jim for arranging this, uh, really on the back of a talk I gave for Org's conference a few weeks ago, um, just after PRISM had, the news of PRISM had broken. Um, so I've got a couple of things to bring to the table. One is that I happen to have been making a study of the law on which PRISM is based, the US law on which PRISM is based, in the past two years, and wrote a report about it for the European Union. And, uh, of course, now we also have news of Tempora, which is ultimately going to be based on, on RIPA, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. And it so happened when I was director of FIPR, uh, Foundation for Information Policy Research, back in 2000, uh, I made a special study of RIPA, particularly, I think, the parts which are going to be relevant for Tempora. And there is a very ancient blog, <coughs> before there were actually blogs, still up on fipr.org slash rip slash. You need the final slash. Hasn't been maintained for 12 years. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff there. So I think the first point I'd want to make is that allies have always spied on allies. And a classic example of this is the operations of British security coordination, particularly in Washington, D.C., uh, before America entered the Second World War, which was really about systematically trying to influence American public opinion in favor of entering the war. Uh, and another data point is that in 2010, fascinatingly, the National Security Agency, but not in fact GCHQ, declassified some of the original papers on the foundation of what was then called BRUSA, um, Britain-United States Agreement, then became UK-USA, and that is then the basis of the famous Five Eyes Alliance of Five Anglo-Saxon Countries for Intelligence Sharing. Uh, since we have very little time today, I won't repeat my usual anecdotes about that. But the other very important element of this talk is to understand what we mean by cloud computing. Often this is mistaken to be some kind of meaningless industry buzzword, and it, it can be that. Uh, but it also has, I think, a very significant structural meaning for what's been going on in computing for the past four years or so. And the point I want to make is cloud has two different meanings. When you read about cloud in the popular press, it probably means services like Facebook and Skype and Microsoft and Google, places to store data, places to do your email. But it also has a business connotation with services like Azure, Office 365, Google Apps, and Amazon. And in fact, it's my belief that it's the business use of cloud computing for data processing, which is going to be far more significant for our privacy and for the economic forces that we're going to have to cope with in the future. On the left, you've got a modern data center. On the right, you have room 641A. Does that number ring a bell with anybody? Hands up, who's 641A? Okay. So to, to give the context of this story, we have to talk about what became known as the warrantless wiretapping affair in the United States, which happened between 2001 and 2007, uh, although it was only in the press from 2005. In brief, what happened was one part of the story, uh, a technician working for AT&T in San Francisco, one day at his office, some men from the National Security arrived with special badges, and they said that they were building a new installation in his office, uh, and he dug around a bit and found out that what was going on is they were taking one of the main fiber optic cables from the western seaboard of the US and splitting it. They were plugging in the split into a high-performance deep packet inspection box, which was triaging the traffic in some way, and then filtering and relaying it, some part of it, in real time to the National Security Agency. The diagram here was produced by the American Civil Liberties Union in about 2006 by extrapolating some of the documentation that Mark Klein brought with him. By looking at the reference numbers and the serial numbers on the documentation for the job sheet, 
they were able to infer that this kind of installation hadn't just been made in San Francisco, but probably in more than a dozen other internet exchange points around the US. So the law which underlies PRISM, uh, and this has now been confirmed by uh, the Director of National Intelligence, Clapper, is the Pfizer Amendment Act, 2008, Section 1881A. This has an alternate numbering in the Consolidated Act Pfizer now of 702, but when you read about 702, 1881A, same thing. So what this law did is it combined three elements which had been present in previous legislation separately, it brought them together for the first time in one place. Firstly, this law can only be used intentionally to target non-Americans outside the US. So when I say only, that is 95% of the world, that is the rest of the world outside the US. Secondly, uh, and very peculiarly, nobody noticed this at the time. There is nothing in the record, nothing in uh, American Civil Liberties commentary about this, nothing in the congressional record, but it snuck in this term remote computing services. All previous versions of Pfizer had dealt essentially with interception of communications. This essentially allowed, because it covers all modern forms of cloud computing, allowed the authorities to go inside the data center and extract data in plain text where any decryption by SSL to and from the cloud would have been removed so the data can be processed. Thirdly, uh, this is authorizing, it includes the potential for what I call purely political surveillance. Citizens in the rest of the world doing ordinary, lawful, democratic, political things in their own countries, this is within the realm of the surveillance. Moreover, there is what I would call a double discrimination by nationality going on here. Not only is the law only allowed to be applied to the rest of the world and not Americans by nationality, also in the very definition of what it covers, the law varies depending on whether you have US nationality or not. And the law is much broader if you're not. How does this come about? Well, the term of art is foreign intelligence information. And when you look at the definition, which is quite complicated, more complicated typically than we would have in European laws, it expressly talks about things like sabotage and money laundering and terrorism, but there is this limb of the definition which is, frankly, almost nowhere discussed in any of the legal commentary. And when you unwind the definitions, it amounts to this. Information with respect to a foreign-based political organization or foreign territory that relates to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. So, that can be just about anything. It can be, doesn't have to be a political party, it can simply be any information generated by people who are not American, uh, which in some way relates to the foreign affairs of the United States. Incredibly broad. Um, moreover, when I talked about a double discrimination just now, this word relates, if you were a US citizen, that word would be necessary. Necessary, a very tough legal criterion, relates, obviously, a very expansive criterion. It also turns out that the protections of the Fourth Amendment, the famous uh, Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution, which protects persons and papers and no warrant shall issue, but on probable cause. Uh, and probable cause is generally, the history of this in law is very complicated, but it generally is a criterion of suspicion of guilt of some criminal offense. So you have to persuade a judge that there is sufficient evidence that there's a 50% likelihood that you are the guy who did it. Now, I haven't got time to go through uh, all of the steps of reasoning here, but essentially it emerged in the judgment of uh, the secret court that deals with the FISA Act. In 2010, the judgment was published uh, of a case that actually was made in 2008. And when, I think I may have been the first person to spot this, when you read that judgment, you find that if you are a foreigner, then the court has sort of magicked away the element of criminality. So probable cause in the context of this FISA law, if you're a foreigner, simply means a 50% probability that you are a foreigner. And if there's a 50% probability that you are a foreigner, then you don't have any privacy protection from the Fourth Amendment. And in fact, you don't have any privacy protection from anything else. So, to summarize, anything that falls into that incredibly broad category of foreign intelligence information if there's a 50% probability that you're a foreigner, 
then all of that can be swept up and analysed with no other privacy criterion or protection or suspicion whatsoever. So something very interesting has happened in the past two weeks, uh, which one can only, I think, get at by analysing five minutes of the testimony of the director of the NSA to Congress, which happened about two weeks ago. And he said something which, frankly, shocked me, and I hope you'll be able to appreciate the irony. He said that the other leak, the first leak of the Verizon warrants, which actually was to do with the Patriot Act, Section 215, passed in 2001, this law was originally passed to gather up library records. That was how it was sold to Congress. This law has, in fact, well, different laws, probably since very shortly after 911. But at any rate, this law is now being used to gather up all of the telephone metadata for all of the domestic communications of the United States and internationally. Why? What is this being used for? Well, for the first time, General Alexander told us this information has been put into a sort of learning algorithm, black box, which has been trained on the basis of five years traffic analysis to discriminate whether somebody is 50% likely to be American or not. So. This, in fact, uh, the Fisk Court took this decision back in 2006 in secrecy. So the purpose for all of this blanket data retention as used in the US is to put it into a learning algorithm so that an analyst can make an instant 50% pro probable cause judgment, not about your criminality, but simply about whether the Fourth Amend Amendment should protect you. If you're 50% likely to be foreign and it doesn't, he pushes a button, and then your conversations can then be instantly monitored on the authority of a shift supervisor. So there is a profound irony in this because of course we have blanket data retention in Europe. Uh, in fact, it was made in Britain. It was passed after 9-11 in our Patriot Act and then uh, kind of foisted on the rest of Europe by Charles Clark back in 2006. But of course, it is utterly illegal in the European Convention of Human Rights terms to discriminate somebody's human rights on the basis strictly of their nationality. The law must be blind under ECHR to somebody's nationality, and you cannot go around discriminating the level of privacy protection according to that. So there is some profound irony uh, that the Fisk Court said in 2006, almost to destroy the village, or to save the village, but to destroy the village. Americans have no association with privacy. Who is talking to who? What can be inferred from that kind of traffic analysis simply didn't register with them, and they sacrificed all of that to preserve the protection of Americans' Fourth Amendment by of, of content. I find that profoundly ironic. This is, uh, the next clip is just to illustrate how hard it is to talk about the rights of non-Americans in American political discourse. It's actually two very, um, uh, of, of the leading American civil liberties privacy advocates being grilled uh, rather aggressively by a Texas congressman, and it sort of speaks for itself. Let me see if you and I can agree on something. Does the Fourth Amendment apply to foreign targets in foreign lands? I don't think that's the question presented by No, 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 that's my question. So, no, I, so I promise you it's the right question, because that's my question. <laughs> I, I, uh, does it apply? I don't think it does. Well, when you say you don't think it does. Well, I, in the circumstance of this statute, I don't think it does. Right, I and mean, we certainly haven't made the argument that it does. Does the Fourth Amendment I'm not talking about a statute. I'm talking about, does the Fourth Amendment apply to foreign nationals in foreign lands? It does not. Does the Second Amendment apply? Um, I don't know the, the first the law, but I think no. Eighth? I think it would depend on the circumstance. Women's suffrage, does that apply? No. Okay, that, that, that's my point. They don't. So we're not talking about foreign, we're not talking about surveillance of foreign nationals in foreign lands, right? Because you don't think there's a constitutional communication. That's my second point. So the, the, the hearing that was held to actually discuss the Pfizer law we're talking about, Section 702, they were specifically talking about the very same law underlying prison, uh, and that was back uh, in May last year. And essentially the civil liberties advocates were driven back onto saying, no, we're only here to defend, if you like, the incidental impact of this law on Americans, potentially. We have no basis for arguing that non-Americans have any right to be protected. Um, so 
A lot of this, not all of it, because some of it subsequently happened, was put into a report that I co-authored for the European Parliament, uh, which was published in November last year, and sort of sank without trace until an American uh, journalist, Ryan Gallagher, wrote a very tight 800 words about it on an American blog, ironically, and sort of broke the story that essentially predicted, this report sort of predicted what we subsequently learned from prison, if I say so, with some prescient accuracy. Uh, the reaction of the media flurry around the time in January was, frankly, outrage. European public opinion could not understand what is the point of having this highfalutin data protection law in Europe if it can't protect us from, essentially, the untrammeled activities of foreign intelligence agencies. It's a very good question. What a point, the point I want to make in this slide on the left here is that there's kind of three categories of information we should be thinking about. There's purely criminal information to do with criminal law enforcement uh, that is pretty well protected legally within the EU when countries within the EU exchange it, the green there. Um, but there's also, and then there's national security information about the national security well-defined of European mem Union member states, including the UK, and then there's this third category of information, all states do it, of political spying, essentially furthering the interests of your country uh, and the foreign policy of your country by spying and getting what you can. So the point here is that the red zone uh, transfers, in fact, both of national security and foreign political type information, we're exposing that information. If that is sent to the US, it is not protected by the Fourth Amendment, it's not protected by EU data protection, I haven't got time to make that case, but there are loopholes almost built in to data protection. Uh, it's not protected by Convention 108, it's not protected by the Cybercrime Convention, and it's not protected by ECHR, because of course, once it's in America, it's out of range of ECHR. You might wonder, what is the British Information Commissioner's Office doing, thinking about all of this? Well, in October last year, they issued their guidance on cloud computing, and those two paragraphs basically say that if a British company or indeed a, a processor, a cloud processor whom they employ, an American company, comply with a Pfizer or Patriot order, well, the information commissioner isn't going to punish them. It's a sort of preemptive deference and deferential cringe to the extraterritorial American power. Rather extraordinary. So what do we know about PRISM? Uh, well, I only know what I've been reading in the press, same as you, some information that I've been able to extract. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, Director of National Intelligence Clapper has confirmed that the, the law 802, 702 is, is the one that is underlying PRISM. The Washington Post had this term about selectors or search terms designed to produce 51% confidence, which exactly matches what we learned from the previous evidence leading up to the European report. Uh, there have been various deni sort of non-denial denials with carefully word, careful wordsmithing uh, about whether or not there's direct access. Of course, the company's line is we're just complying with court orders. Well, these are rather particular kind of court orders because they give the kind of blanket authorization purely based on nationality that I've described. Then we seem to have got subtly sidetracked after Keith Vaz's intervention very quickly to ask, well, is GCHQ making use of PRISM? And that seems to me quite beside the point. The point seems to me the unilateral power of another country to spy on us in the UK in total secrecy. That should be the point, I think, that Parliament should be investigating. And of course, we don't know whether there are other programs with different code words, which perhaps also use the 702 law. Maybe these programs exist already, or in the future could exist, which are designed to spy on the business side of cloud computing. Because what we know so far about PRISM is they all seem to be consumer-facing services and not the business kind of use of cloud computing, uh, which I regard as, in a sense, threatening for the future. But what do we know about Tempura? Uh, again, we've just got the Guardian reports to go on, but uh, conceptually it seems to be uh, the use of existing powers in law to intercept fibre optic cables really when they come ashore uh, at the UK. And what I think is extraordinary, what I certainly didn't foresee, is just an enormous quantity of information, probably from something like two to 400 cables, is now being held in a memory buffer. Sort of first in, first out buffer. So three days of content, according to the Guardian documents, is available, or 30 days of metadata, obviously much less data. And that data can be scanned and trawled through. And as of May last year, again, the Guardian reports, 
There are 300 GCHQ analysts and 250 NSA analysts working on scanning through this material. Uh, it's an interesting question. Is the NSA doing this at their end too? And if not, why not? Why does, according to the Guardian reports, this seem to be such a, a prized asset that GCHQ has brought to the table? Well, it could be, this is speculation, that the 702 law, with its 50% nationality criterion, actually prevents the NSA from capturing and buffering all of this information in the way that GCHQ is doing. I don't know if that's true. It has to be said the NSA whistleblowers don't believe that. They think the NSA is grabbing absolutely everything from everywhere. I don't know. Is tempora lawful? I'm coming to the end soon. I apologize for the speaker running over slightly. Um, well, uh, RIPA um, has in section 8.4b1 the concept of a certificated warrant. What a certificated warrant is, is you take a regular interception warrant used within the UK, which has to name a target or a device, uh, and then the Secretary of State can write a certificate which says, as long as you use this for only external communications, which is Ripper's jargon for essentially communications that cross the border, international communications, uh, as long as the Secretary of State issues this certificate, which has to name the sort of thing that you want to scan for, uh, then you can troll. So essentially, it's, it's uh, a counterpart to a FISA warrant. And of course, the difference is that whereas with a FISA warrant has this strict criterion of Americans are untouchable, it's impossible for European legislation, more or less, to have such a nationality-based criterion. Although there is something in German law, which is kind of interesting. So the other very significant part of RIPA is in section 5.6, where they say that a conduct authorized by a warrant is going to be lawful, even if it includes hoovering up an enormous quantity or an unlimited quantity of communications which aren't covered by the warrant. So presumably, the justification underlying tempura is going to be, well, we need to have the capability to trawl through all of the communications to find stuff on a particular subject. And Ripper allows us to do that and create this enormous buffer because even though that's capturing stuff which may not be covered by the certificate, well, that's what we need to do to do what we need to do. Um, there was, I did look up from 2000. There was a little bit of discussion in the Standing Committee uh, on this point in the House of Commons, uh, an amendment not moved on whether reckless use of this sort of get-out clause should be penalised, and some really uh, good chat theory of government on display when MPs decided, well, of course, no one at GCHQ is going to abuse this power. Surely not. Uh, and in the House of Lords, there again was a very late night discussion at the committee stage where, uh, in fact, a question that I prompted was discussed. And then the government minister said, well, I can't really go into this sort of area about black boxes being attached to fiber optic cables. You know, this is the most sensitive part of the legislation. I'm sure my noble lords will understand. And uh, there was this rather dry response, I think, from the opposition benches saying, well, I think that's the best answer we're going to get. And then the business closed and the, 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 the bill moved on. Uh, then there's the whole dimension of Human Rights Act and ECHR compatibility, which is a whole other discussion, and I'm not going to go into that. Finally, um, there is a bit of a ripper mystery. It was the most interesting part of ripper that I dealt with. Um, and I wrote uh, two briefs about it. There were two good debates on it in the House of Lords, and frankly, I'm none the wiser. But what it says is, in the case of these certificated warrants, you might think that because it's only dealing with international communications, well, at least we know that GCHQ cannot be scanning and trawling domestic communications inside the UK. Well, they can. Effectively, in my view, what Section 16 did is it created a third type of warrant where for three months at a time, the Secretary of State can effectively authorize GCHQ to scan inside the UK, providing, as it were, uh, these are communications which have been scooped up inadvertently in the external hall, and providing that you're not targeting somebody, as it were, providing you don't know who you're looking for. So this power can be used for trawling inside the UK on condition that it's stuff you've sort of scooped up anyway, and you shouldn't abuse this power to uh, look for stuff that you could ordinarily look for with a conventional warrant, but providing you don't do either of those things, yes, you can trawl inside the UK. 
Um, and then there's a very mysterious concept invented by the first interception commissioner in 1986, possibly to do with the problem known as reverse targeting called an overlapping warrant, which has no statutory basis, that has some connection to this, but we really don't know because essentially the government did not choose to reply on these points substantively in 2000. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We, Tom and I and Katie, are protected by the Wilson Doctrine from having our communications intercepted, at least we are in theory, um, by any UK agency. It was always assumed um, uh, in this conspiracy theory that, well, men with Hill would do it instead, you know, so the, the Americans do it instead. Now, I never really paid much attention to this, partly because we could never test it, and partly, sort of, we, we aren't really private anyway, so who cares? But the, uh, but that was, that, just rest that in front of you for a second while we talk about what we've just been hearing about. There, there, you've heard about the explicit um, uh, communications laws, RIPA and others, that relate to this. Uh, and it's always been apparent that they are being, there have been pretty poor protections for the public. I mean, even the ones that don't go into grand things like this, the more, the more domestic stuff, is based on a warranty process which largely involves a man at the next desk saying, yes, you can do it. Uh, I mean, I'm being slightly um, hyper, hyperbolic, but not entirely. Um, and indeed, I know some intercept commissioners have worried about that over time. Basically, it's not a judicial process. Um, at most, it's a political process. The other thing which Caspi didn't mention was the UKS, the SIS um, uh, legislation in 1994. I took it through the House, <laughs> um, which actually basically gives a Secretary of State the right to tell a spook, you can break the law. You, know, you, can, you can break a law on a specific target for a specific six months and so on. Um, I don't know, even though I was involved in drafting it, I don't know what the extent of that is, but basically it's a catch-all. And the idea was, in the old days, that bugging, blackmailing and burglary, the sort of three Bs that the spooks get up to, were uh, approved for specific reasons at specific times, basically to stop them being put in prison. So that's the sort of um, legal backdrop. Now, this temporal program in particular, which I want to talk, to, talk about for a, for a moment or two, the temporal program, the sweeping up of all of this data for a short period of time, um, we know nothing of formally. Um, the thing that I think they said was that they effectively handed over the whole lock, stock and barrel to the Americans unvetted and unchecked. Now, given that we have uh, uh, restrictions on any um, surveillance of our own citizens, uh, both both uh, metadata and actual data. This, of course, is a massive bypass. Now, this obviously was very expensive to do. This is not a small operation we're talking about here. It's enormous. So a large chunk of British public money was spent on this. Um, why? And why do we give the entire product to another country? Now, there are, there's one sort of... Um, uh, saintly reason and one not so saintly reason. Uh, the saintly reason isn't really saintly, it's only saintly in spook talk, um, is that historically GCHQ's relationship with the Americans has rested on exchange. Now, you, you're sort of led to believe in the, in the public uh, area that this is because they're so good. It isn't really. Uh, uh, NSA is massively bigger. The, uh, the amount that GCHQ could add is actually quite small by comparison, although we're in sometimes better parts of the world. What was always historically useful was we had Hong Kong and we had Cyprus in the days before, um, uh, before uh, satellites, really. So Cyprus gave an enormous window on the Middle East and Hong Kong, of course, gave an enormous window on China, both of them enormously important to the Americans, supporting Israel in the Middle East and uh, their operations in China. Of course, they're both irrelevant now. I mean, Hong Kong's gone anyway, but satellites would, would make it irrelevant. And uh, in the Middle East, there's very little line of sight traffic. So our big chip has gone. So it's just possible that Tempera was the replacement chip. Just possible. I don't know. Just possible. The other possible explanation is we're getting something back for it, which brings me back to the Men with Hill conspiracy theory. Are we getting a trade? And the trade wouldn't have to be explicit. It, it could be, just give us anything that looks interesting. You know? don't actually have to ask for it, it just comes back. And that's not that unusual in intelligence, intelligence exercise, if it's coming back um, uh, relating to terrorist events that relate to us. But that makes it the 
the, uh, well, to call it a loophole, it's a bit like describing the Channel Tunnel as a loophole. It's enormous. Um, and what it demonstrates from our point of view is that actually our supervision procedures in this country are completely useless. I mean, not just weak, as we thought, but completely useless. Um, and let me just take one component to show you what I mean. You just heard about the comments in the House of Lords. The, the, the end stop warrant in all this is the Secretary of State's warrant, let us say the Foreign Secretary. The Foreign Secretary uh, signs this off. Uh, he then comes up in the House of Commons. What does he say? We never comment on security matters. So it's become a sort of circular warrant. There is no accountability to Parliament. The only accountability to Parliament, and it's not really accountability to Parliament, is via the Intelligence Security Committee. But that doesn't report to Parliament. That reports to the Prime Minister, and to all intents and purposes is appointed by the Prime Minister. So in effect, the executive has control of it, but Parliament has no sight at all. Which means that what Tempera has done, in political terms, has run up a really big red flag, saying, actually, we have to think completely from scratch uh, about all of, the, all of the oversight arrangements we currently have. Because if this can happen, and it's as described in the papers, and I'm in no position to say it is or it isn't, but if it's as described in the papers, then our systems don't work. Very good. Thank you, David. I'm Great. going to ask Simon now. Simon is a UK, foremost uh, UK expert on surveillance laws. We've got a small presentation, and then we'll reopen questions at the end, if that's OK with you, Simon. It's not an opportunity to warm the audience up uh, with the story of Professor um, Sir John Smith, the, the uh, prominent uh, legal academic who, during the last lecture he gave on criminal law at the age of 81, approached the lectern uh, on two sticks and, and uh, tremulously said to the audience that he was told he should never lecture for less than he could make, less time than he could make love to a beautiful woman, um, and promptly looked at his wristwatch and said that he would be another two hours. <laughs> um, it was perhaps uh, at the site that he, that he died on St Valentine's Day about nine years ago. I'm reading a book at the minute, it's um, by an author called uh, Baumeister, it's all about the subject of willpower, and I, I was fascinated while I was uh, preparing for this short presentation to read that, that research reveals that people who go to church are more self-disciplined than the rest of us. And the reason for this is that they believe that God is constantly watching them. And I thought, therefore, that I would create this uh, canvas upon which to paint some of the detail of UK surveillance on. I've entitled the presentation UK Surveillance Law, A, a Divine Comedy. Oh, there's divine intervention. Um, divine Comedy in, in three acts, and the three acts of the primary legislation uh, governing not, not what CASP was talking about, but what UK intelligence agencies can do with it once it gets here. So that um, is the context. If, if I may, I'd just continue the uh, religious theme uh, just a little bit longer, um, because of course one's reminded in this context uh, of the, the landscape uh, in terms of uh, law governing intelligence agencies. It's about a hundred years since our agencies were formed and have been bugging and burgling across the capital city um, throughout that period of time. And until relatively recently, and I'm talking here about the mid-80s to the late 80s, it was somewhat biblical, the legal landscape. I'm quoting here from Genesis, verse 1, uh, where it said that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the, the same could be uh, said of legislation governing surveillance activities of our agencies, at least until Harriet Harman, a then a legal officer with liberty, decided to take the security service in and uh, brought a claim before Europe uh, alleging that the security service were monitoring her communications while she was working at liberty. Uh, the European Court held that there'd been a violation of Article 8 of the Convention and in, res and in response for the first time in 80 years since its inception. MI5 was placed on a statutory footing with the creation of the Security Service Act 1989. That was closely followed um, by the legislation that's just been referred to um, following a, a petition by Esbester uh, to Europe. 
who um, e equally claimed that the activities of GCHQ had no le proper legal basis in UK law. And again, reactively, the UK enacted the Intelligence Services Act 1994. Uh, and I'm going to look at both of those very, very briefly because they are the gateway w uh, under which uh, British intelligence agencies manage all of this mega data as it's referred to once it lands uh, in UK territory. There is a distinction, mention has been made of Ripper. Uh, Ripper was the first comprehensive attempt by the UK to legislate for surveillance activities. And interestingly for me, as a covert policing anorak, um, it was anticipatory. Uh, you know, legislators sat there, saw the Human Rights Act on the landscape and said, or on the horizon and said, we have to legislate for activities such as uh, undercover police officers and informants and other forms of surveillance. And as a result, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act uh, came into being. And my life uh, has since been somewhat torturous uh, ever since trying to understand it. Um, the reality is uh, that, that to say that the, the activities of the intelligence agencies and police uh, in this area is regulated is somewhat of, of a confidence trick. Now, I looked up the definition of that before I came down here today, and it is a trick to get someone to do what you want. Uh, there are various alternative uh, phrases, bamboozle, deceive, hocus pocus, and at the other end of the polarity, uh, bullshit. Uh, slide uh, one relates to the relevant extract from the Security Service Act 1989. Now, in effect, um, the legislation is very short now, it's, m most of it's been repealed, but the empowering part of it uh, still remains in force. And it br briefly deals with the Director General's responsibilities. And it says that it's his duty, or in the uh, necessary case, her duty, to ensure that there are arrangements for securing that no information is obtained by the service except so far as is necessary for the proper discharge of its functions or, and for me importantly, disclosed by it, except so far as is necessary for that purpose. And the arrangements referred to uh, above shall be such so as to ensure that the information in the possession of the service is not disclosed for use in determining whether a person should be employed, etc. So, so that is your gateway in, in English law. That the security service domestically has responsibility for ensuring that it acquires information in the discharge of its statutory functions, that's national security, economic well-being, uh, prevention and detection of crime, of crime in certain circumstances, and also that it discloses in the performance of those functions. Now, where it acquires it domestically, it, uh, Ripper may engage, but where it acquires it externally from, from other countries, then it just embraces it warmly uh, as it arrives in volumes. The same is true of the 1994 Act. You'll see it's worded in almost precisely the same terms. It's the director of GCHQ on this occasion. Uh, there are similar rules applicable to SIS or MI6. Uh, the director of GCHQ shall ensure that there are arrangements for securing that no information is obtained except, as, uh, so, except so far as is necessary for the proper discharge of its functions. And similarly, um, the regulation of how it must disclose. Now, um, it seems to me uh, that the, the obvious consequence of this is that the US, or, or any other uh, foreign <coughs> government for that matter, may provide us with whatever information it likes about our own citizens, about our own citizens, that is captured whilst they're outside of the confines of our country's uh, borders. Uh, it's why also that our foreign secretary can stand up proudly when the story breaks about the existence of prison and other uh, spectres that GCHQ at all times are acting strictly in accordance with the law. The reason for that is, is that there is in fact no law. Um, the, the current preoccupation, incident, I just want to dwell on this because of course the current preoccupation, it's quite right that it is, is of mass acquisition of surveillance data, but a really important point not to be forgotten here is the issue of disclosure, because whether we like it or not, there is this uh, vast acquisition of our 
information, but some of that information, once it's acquired, may be very useful to us for other purposes. As a criminal defence lawyer, for example, an obvious example might be if it's exculpatory, if it proves a client wasn't in a certain place at a certain time or wasn't doing what the Crown uh, alleges that he's doing. Or indeed, if I want to allege that I'm being tortured at Guantanamo Bay by representatives of the state. Uh, in those circumstances, I have to rely on the security services director deciding that it's necessary to disclose such information as they hold uh, in the discharge of his statutory functions. And I'm not convinced that that will always be the case. But we can all, of course, uh, sleep easy because 10 years ago, no, 13 years ago, the UK government introduced uh, the regulation of investigating Parcel 2000 Ripper, as it's known. This, uh, just some headlines here, just so that we're very clear about it. It regulates surveillance. It's not creating any new powers of surveillance. Um, so it doesn't um, it enact uh, concepts like prison and other mass data acquisition regimes. Its primary purpose is to place on a statutory footing investigative techniques to ensure compliance with Article 8 of the Convention. Um, and when it says that it creates a legal basis, it's talking strictly in Article 8 terms. That is to say that such acquisition will be, quote, in accordance with law for the purposes of that article. So the big, uh, let me just deal with, um, with the, uh, the, the Ripper's big qualification, if I can put it that, uh, put it that way. It's, this is the penultimate section of Ripper. Remember that Ripper, broadly speaking, governs the acquisition of interception of communications, uh, intrusive surveillance, directed surveillance, the use and conduct of covert human intelligence sources. That's both informants and undercover police officers, as well as issues like encryption and creates the investigatory past tribunal, the secret tribunal to regulate compliance. Uh, the penultimate provision is this. I, I always think it's fascinating. Let me read it out uh, to you so that you can grasp its enormity. <laughs> Nothing in any provision of this act, it, it always reminds me of that, that, that moment during, when you were a kid at school, and they say to you, always read the exam paper, because the last question on the exam paper is going to be, you don't have to answer any of the questions on the exam paper. <laughs> uh, Nothing in any provision of this act, by virtue of which conduct of any description is or may be authorised by any warrant, authorization or notice, all by virtue of which information may be obtained in any manner, shall be construed. So there's nothing in this Act that shall be construed as making it unlawful to engage in any conduct of that description which is not otherwise unlawful under this Act and would not be unlawful apart from this Act. As otherwise requiring the issue grant or giving of such a warrant, that includes a part one warrant for the interception of communications incidentally. Um, authorisation or notice, or the take of any step to, for or towards obtaining the authority of such a warrant, authorisation or notice, before any such conduct of that description is engaged in, or as prejudicing any power to obtain information by any means not involved, not involving conduct that may be authorised in this act. It's very frustrating when you're um, charged with responsibility for. Uh, teaching a room as big as this with as many people uh, in this that are police officers uh, about the Act. And um, when you begin with a, with a provision in the legislation that says this Act is essentially a voluntary code and you don't have to follow it anyway. That's its, um, that's its practical effect, I'm afraid. So who, uh, it seems to me, uh, the big question, uh, or the elephant in the room, who um, guards the guardians? Well, the Foreign Secretary... Uh, the Foreign Secretary's answer to that is that we have nothing to fear if we're doing uh, nothing wrong. Uh, well, I wouldn't want the Foreign Secretary to uh, make an assessment as to whether he thinks what I do may be wrong or not. Um, we come from different worlds. Um, and I'm quite sure that if we ask Doreen and Neville Lawrence today uh, whether uh, they were doing anything wrong, then they were consulting their lawyer in the aftermath of their son's uh, grievous murder. Uh, they may disagree. Uh, my final observation uh, would be this, that we ought really to be concerned with the allocation of resources here. Um, a, a British soldier in broad daylight was hacked to death in this capital city a few short weeks ago by people who may, and I'm not rushing to any conclusions, but let's look at what's out there already, who may 
had been on the intelligence services radar. And the explanation that they come to, or the explanation that they give, is often we can't surveil everybody all of the time. We don't have uh, the resources. Um, that sounds awfully like the conclusion of the inquiry into the 7-7 bombings uh, to me. Some balance does need to be reached, it seems to me. There is, of course, a need uh, for secrecy in certain quarters. But equally, uh, we have to be realistic about what we really need to keep secret. Neither confirm nor deny is a classic example, a blanket, almost impervious immunity from disclosing anything relating to intelligence matters. A veil, uh, for, as far as I'm concerned, that the state can often hide uh, a multitude of sins. Lifted recently, it seems to me, without the world falling off its axis by Sir Desmond de Silva in the report into the murder of Patrick Fumugan, uh, published last December. Greater transparency brings with it greater accountability. There has to be reform whilst we're talking about all of this, of the investigation of past tracking. And if there isn't reform and there isn't a shift, it seems to me that we are, as uh, one of the West's uh, leading democracies, spiralling into Kafka's trial, where we'll wake up one morning to find ourselves accused of something without having done anything wrong, perhaps other than in the assessment of the present Foreign Secretary. And it will end up, as Kafka said it would, that it's only because of their stupidity that they're able to be so sure of themselves. Thank you uh, very much. For those of you who don't know Alistair, he's run a noble campaign for a quarter of a century to get uh, justice uh, for his family. He's lost his brother in a very high-profile murder. There have been five investigations, and the police have admitted that police corruption was at the heart of it. And after this week's revelations about the Lawrence family, I understand why, once again, Alistair, you are asking questions. I don't know whether panel members would like to comment or respond to the specific question. Can I just express, uh, well, first of all, my admiration for your campaign, which I've followed uh, at least on Twitter, and uh, congratulations on the use of the inquiry. Uh, I hope it's what, what you want it to be. I'm sorry, I, I, I've had difficulty hearing, you know, I can hear what you're saying, but I have to stand up. It's, it's just recording, though, isn't it? I've had a difficulty in hearing what's being said. I don't know if it's me, but my... my it's probably the room, Alistair, but yes. we'll speak up, we'll speak up. The, the, the issue that I think you raised, which, which ought to concern all of us, is the protection that's supported to legally privileged communication. Mm -hmm. um, there was some real progress made a few years ago in, uh, following a case in Lincolnshire, where Lincolnshire police had inadvertently, they said, placed a listening device in a, an exercise yard at a police station where lawyers routinely took um, instructions from their client, uh, emerged that, and the findings of the trial judge were in all three cases, where the police had deliberately placed those listening devices for, for that purpose. Um, and unfortunately, stays were imposed on indictments for murder and conspiracy to murder and very serious drug and offences. 
However, in the aftermath of that, a case uh, from Northern Ireland went to the Supreme Court called McEve, and that related to the antics of a fairly disreputable solicitor in Northern Ireland. Um, but the question certified for the Supreme Court was, can RIPA be used deliberately to pick up legally privileged communications? And the conclusion, uh, I think to everybody's surprise, was that the Supreme Court said that it can even though that it doesn't deal with it expressly within the legislation. Thank thankfully, it didn't say how or in what circumstances. I think these are probably still scratching their heads against it. But if it offers you any comfort, I don't think they would be able to bypass the system to listen to your uh, communications electronically. Um, they could, of course, internally authorise, as it appears, or what, this is the allegation, um, of, of course, uh, in the... Uh, in the Lawrence case, they, they could internally authorise the police officers to do it, uh, in the sense that they're proximate to you, but your electronic communications are probably safe. If, if I, well, when you stood up, so you can't speak. There was, of course, another case, you know, yes. um, who, uh, who was also, well, he was a lawyer for somebody, and his, his communications were, were picked up too. Mm -hmm. and, and the police got quite a fright out of that, because he was already, I think, a whip in and the uh, Justice Department, mm -hmm. sort of slightly embarrassing for them. So, um, two things. Number one, I think that historically it's been very slack in the approval process. I mean, when, when I had my by-election, um, the, attorney, the now Attorney General was coming to visit me to, to launch the campaign. And on the train, he, he, uh, a chap walked up to him and said, are you Dominic Grieve? And he said, yes. And uh, he said, will you tell Mr Davis he's doing the right thing because I work in the surveillance commissioner's office and we feel that we frankly have no grip on any of this. So um, there is, there's more pressure on now, but I think there has historically been a very slack approach to this. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mike, I mean, there's some censorship. Um, I'm glad that Simon uh, mentioned uh, Harry Harlan. Uh, and we would only found out about the fucking the trade union members and the direct harm and members of civil liberties groups in the 1980s because the whistleblower, Kathy Bassett, but she was able to blow the whistle because there used to be a public interest defence in the Official Secrets Act that was removed in 1989. My question to Tom and to David is can we have the public interest defence back so that we can find out more about what the security services are up to? Um, uh, Second to that, um, now this has been revealed, obviously the Chinese and Russians have carte blanche to uh, survey British citizens, British corporations, British politicians. How do we now row back against the threat of mass surveillance, not only by our own governments, democratic governments, but by foreign authoritarian governments? Okay, I, I'm going to take uh, comments and questions in threes now, if that's okay, because we're sort of nearly running out of time already. Take there and then. You indicated no gentleman at the back there. So yeah, I, I guess following on from this, um, there's another aspect to the security of communications, which is technically making them secure, whether it's through cryptographic means or <coughs> anonymization. So my question, I guess, for Casper primarily is, from what we know at the moment, how much less secure have these means become? Good question. And then the gentleman sitting down at the back. Andrew Watson, no, finally. I'd be interested in any reflections any of, any of you have on the relationship between this and the communications data bill and where the communications data bill might go from here. Okay, Casper, do you want to come in first on those? Okay, I'll take um, uh, first the, the, the technical issue. Um, I, I think one thing I didn't have time to dwell on today, also for a more general audience, is why I bang on about cloud computing is because every organization is now under the cosh to think about migrating their data to cloud computing. And overwhelmingly, the cloud computing industry is an American industry. And the reason is cost, because you can do almost any type of processing in the cloud, and the cost is at least 50% less, probably, than what you pay before. So it seems to be not just a no-brainer, but absolutely something you'll get driven by your board to do. And I think what we've learned in the last three weeks should t lead us to totally reevaluate that situation. The other reason I bang on about the cloud is there is no technical defense. Now, you may have read about some strange form of encryption called homomorphic encryption, but essentially this is never going to be relevant to policy. And the reason is this. Imagine somebody said to you, 
There's this terrible problem from foreign cars being imported into the EU, which is sort of horrible pollution. They spew out pollution. But we think we can fix them. If we put all our best mathematicians into, into a research program for the next five or ten years, we think we could build a car that's maybe a thousand times more expensive. It's never going to be relevant. For special cases, for military stuff, where you have no choice but to trust remote processing, yeah, it's useful to some extent. It's just not relevant because the alternative is to buy a European car, to actually have data protection law with some of the national security loopholes closed, which does actually more directly reflect ECHR jurisprudence. And there are a lot of loopholes to get rid of in the current Brussels regulation, which frankly were not being paid attention to before the PRISM agenda. Um, but that is, in a sense, the best bet. You keep your cloud data close, you keep it local, and you don't really let it out to anybody else's jurisdiction. Because once you do, secret laws can get at that data from the inside. Now, as far as the state of the sort of technical defences, uh, I noticed, for example, there's something in the press at the moment about perfect forward secrecy. I can't explain what that is. Very useful if you're American. But of course, one of the implications of what I said is if you're not American, all of this data can be got at through PRISM from the inside. So having forward, for perfect forward secrecy on your SSL well, unfortunately, it's nice to have, but it's not actually going to protect you if you're not American and don't enjoy the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I'm also on the board of Tor, and I certainly think that we're going to have to look at uh, upping the key lengths, and there is work in progress on that, but there's, frankly, a much more pressing need to greatly expand the number of Tor relays, because three or 4,000 relays is, frankly, not a great deal of data to imagine being collected and shared by world intelligence agencies were they minded to do that. I don't know if that's occurring, but one has to take that possibility much more seriously. I, I could comment on the other questions, but I should get my panelists get in. So I would like just, just ah. to very briefly and flagrantly apologise that I'm someone who reached a certain tornado in Germany. Well done. Uh, okay. Good. Well done. You're allowed to plug whatever you do. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just come back to Michael's point about... Uh, Really yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. It, one of the problems we have at the moment, and one of the things I think that made the newspaper editors uh, antagonistic to uh, the communication statehood was the notion that it would be the end of whistleblowers. Uh, traditionally, when there's a whistleblower in Whitehall, there's, there's a leak inquiry, it goes over three weeks and nothing happens, and it back to work. You know? uh, once you've got the communication statehood, place, every whistle will be found, uh, eventually, every, every whistleblower. Um, and I think that we have to think very hard about direct whistleblower protection, so whistleblower protection uh, for whistleblowers to MPs, which does not exist at all at the moment. There's no, if you come and see me about something, you've got no protection at all in law. Um, and frankly, Tom and I agree with me on this, uh, public interest defense for newspapers as well, on some of these things, because it's more difficult. Um, in terms of the past. Um, just on the other, the, the other two things, uh, communication status bill. Um, this goes in waves, my level of optimism about seeing this off. We've seen it off once, uh, pretty successfully, I'm pleased to say. Um, but immediately post mortgage, you saw the great rush of um, people saying, oh, we've got to have it, and this is necessary. Even though MI5 themselves admitted it would have made no difference whatsoever. Actually, I would argue it would make more villages more likely because they waste their time tracking down far more data about you and me and not about proper terrorists. So um, it goes up and down. Now, I see that the chance of communication data will get through the house in the next year is probably near zero because it's very really temporary. So, so it goes like that. It goes up and down like that. One of the side effects um, of uh, tempera uh, has been in the last five days a number of people who are huge sceptics about this whole area in Parliament have come up to me and said, well, maybe you're right. You know, that, <laughs> so so um, I can't give you a clear answer. I think at the moment uh, it's, it's quite likely that we've seen it off for a year or so. Um, but I'm hoping that people like Reading, the Commissioner, um, will keep pushing the story because then this is the only time you'll ever hear me say this in my entire life, <laughs> the European Union might be the answer. <laughs> uh, no, I'll briefly answer, but I am in the chair. I, I, I actually 
think the notion of public interest defence for journalists is very important as well, post, uh, post Leveson, and uh, whistleblower protection is absolutely uh, vital. Uh, and I share David's analysis of where we're at on um, the comms data bill. I, I've had more emails this week from MPs saying, please could you explain to me what metadata is <laughs> than at any point. And I see that as a good thing, because I just forward them to Jim, who then gives me the definition. But anyway, <laughs> one observation about the OSA, which I think is terribly important, uh, and that is that, that it's even more difficult for intelligence agency uh, officers to whistleblow than it is for someone in the Ministry of Defence because it's a strict liability provision uh, without any proof of damage at all. If you're a member of the Security Service or SIS or GCSU and you whistleblow, you will be arrested and you will be charged with defence under the official secrets act. The same is not true of a Crown Serpent. Is that right? Um, you have to prove damage in those circumstances. Small distinction between subsection 1, subsection 1, and subsection 3. Can I just add one point to that? Even though there's crown servant protection in some respects, the reaction of governments to whistleblowers is positively vicious and vindictive. Uh, people have ended up with slurs about their sex lives, uh, on criminal, uh, uh, being prosecuted for uh, criminal offences, even when um, there have been internal documents here inside the department saying what they did did no harm. So it, we shouldn't underestimate this. A whistleblower, frankly, in today's environment, has to be near insane to actually blow the whistle uh, because they get so badly turned out. So I just want a couple of additional points. One, a slightly different twist on whistleblowing. Um, I do think that we owe an immense debt to Edward Snowden. And I have no doubt whatsoever at this stage that he's genuine and the information that he has revealed has been the most important information and surveillance research that we've had for 25 years and possibly ever. Um, now, having said that, I mentioned the report I wrote for the Euro European Parliament last year, and it was very difficult to get, as it were, attention in abstract to the danger of the FISA law, but I did manage to get two or three amendments tabled in the European New Data Protection Regulation, one of which would provide protection for whistleblowers anticipating Edward Snowden, because frankly, if another foreign government is going to do this, and in the future it could be the Chinese or the Indian or Singaporean government, we will only know this through whistleblowers. So it is very important that we build into the framework of data protection law a duty on data protection authorities to receive this information and maybe to reward this information. My original proposal, which I'm afraid the EU didn't go for back in February, was that a whistleblower should get 20% of any fine subsequently levied on a data controller for an illegal, illegal conduct in yielding to such a uh, proposal. So it would be self-financing. Uh, but we can't bank on all whistleblowers being as altruistic as Snowden in future, and this is a crucial part of the protection regime. Uh, incidentally, another amendment I proposed, which is going to be voted on at some stage in, in Brussels, uh, is that if your data is going to be sent into the cloud outside European jurisdiction, you should get a big fat warning message. You should literally get a big red border pop-up saying your data may be subject to foreign surveillance by, for political purposes by a foreign government. Are you okay with this? <laughs> and that is intended to have a political effect. I mean, obviously. Uh, and nor is it in fact unreasonable because you'll get the uh, counter argument that, oh, well, how can we do that with all the people whose data we already collected? Well, use user-centric identity management and that would be a nice thing anyway. Um, just one final point on the communications data bill, um, and going back to, to Woolwich. Now, we didn't find in the joint committee when they reported uh, on the communications data bill any reference to the concept or the duality between data preservation as a concept and blanket data retention. This is something I've been trying to get on the agenda for more than 10 years. Data preservation is you start with a target list very much like interception warrants, but just a bigger target list because it's a lower threshold of suspicion to collect metadata. And you say, well, let's watch these people's metadata. And you do that with prior authorization. The French managed to do this, apparently satisfactorily, for 75,000 targets, anti-terror targets, and they give prior scrutiny to this, uh, at least to the access of the data. Now, my point is that if you use the same sort of apparatus which Bill Binney of the National Security Agency developed about 10 years ago and has apparently been trialled in the UK, thin thread. If you applied that methodology to data preservation, you might end up with a system which was almost as effective from the law enforcement point of view as blanket data retention, 
but would only be keeping data about maybe 1% of the population. Now, 1% of blanket data retention is, any way you slice it, a vast, vast, vast improvement and more proportionate for privacy. Yet, we have never had any consideration of this, or indeed acknowledgement of this as a policy option from any part of the UK government in, in 13 years. Okay, one, one final round of questions. The gentleman here, the gentleman at the back. Hi, I'm Martin Hoskins. I was the special advisor to the Royal Commission on the Data Bill and Data Bill. Just to your point on data preservation, the reason that I wanted to discuss it, there wasn't any time to, to discuss it. But the major point really is a paper to Tom and David, because one of the key uh, recommendations of the report was that it should rapidly, uh, rapidly ramp up the regulation of uh, the law enforcement authorities. And so even, even if there are bits of the bill that you don't like, I don't think that you should use that as an excuse not to try to ramp up the, the regulation of the law enforcement community to make sure that what goes on is proper and lawful and Excuse my naivety, but um, I believe Mr. Snowden was charged by the American authorities with stealing data. That data apparently has been used by the Guardian. Why aren't they being investigated? What we know is that in terms of how the law is drafted, is that the, 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 the critical and determining factor is when the communication is in the course of its transmission. And it's only ever looking at a telephone call as an example. If um, David was a covert human intelligence source, I'm sure it was not. But the government will neither confirm nor deny that. But if, he, if I was having a kind of conversation now and he was listening to that, uh, one side of it, he could report back on that. But as my voice enters into the telephone handset, it converts to electromagnetic energy. And it's only then that it's in the course of its transmission. Um, if I'm in a car and it's hands free and, and you dare to share both sides of that conversation, he could report on it and give evidence of that next Ironically, if, if he's not around and it's electromagnetic pulse and it's recorded, it's not admissible uh, in a UK court because um, you can't uh, ask any question or disclose anything that would suggest or tend to suggest an intercept one is in front. Um, so what, what, all, all we know really about the technical capabilities, it has to happen at the point it converts from sound wave to electromagnetic energy. The same is true at the other end of the process. And one of the big issues, actually, it's been very interesting to, to see how this unfolds in the present prosecutions of those accused of conspiring to intercept their communications, how that will be defined by the courts. And I think it's already in the Court of Appeal as we speak, and will be in the Supreme Court before the end of this year. Um, look, the, the committee did, in many ways, a, 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 an awesome job, but they, they, in my view, really sort of Fought the, fought the game on two issues. Number one was they were persuaded that the internal supervision, as it were, uh, authorization mechanisms were robust. Uh, I do not believe that, I'm afraid. Um, and I'm afraid, in my view, uh, any authorization procedures have to be judicial and external. Uh, and uh, no amount of uh, snow job from the agencies will persuade me otherwise. Had they uh, recommended that, I think we would have been more willing to take it. The second thing is, the committee sort of hit it this direction. I think Ripper needs to be rewritten. When it was brought in front of the House uh, all those years ago, people wound up about terrorism and so on for obvious reasons. Our defence, it was a Labour me measure, but our front bench were completely supine about it. It's the most open-ended, weak piece of regulation that you, that you see. Um, uh, that, uh, that a civilised country uh, has ever had on this sort of subject. We need to rip it all up and start again, bluntly. And if, and if a government says, we'll rip it all up and start again, we'll talk. But as, we, as it stands, we're already wide open. I mean, I, don't, I, I work in a working premise, I have no privacy. It doesn't bother me, the nature of my life. But uh, it's also true of a very large number of other people too. And we need to start again. Yes, a few points. It just reminds me when I was at Microsoft that, I mean, the rumour was around Microsoft was why, one reason why Microsoft had such a hard time dealing with privacy was Bill Gates once said, um, I don't have any privacy. What's, what's that? Um, and I think the politicians may somehow also fall into that uh, trap. Um, cable interception, fiber optic interception. I don't think there's anything very interesting going on here because, for example, under the Telecommunications Act 1984, Section 94, 
the Secretary of State can ask a licensed telco to, to sort of dance naked on a pub table. Um, and they have to do that if they want to hang on there with their license. So we're not really talking about any submarine operations. I mean, the Americans did develop technology for splicing cables and all that sort of thing, but I don't think there's any need for that. Um, on the communications data bill, I, I agree with what's been said uh, ab ab about the... It's a shame that the committee were not more sceptical. Um, of course, they said, well, we went and have a look. We talked to all the good chaps, and they, they seem to be doing a, a splendid job. But if you want a, a good laugh, uh, look up my evidence in my written submission and see what I said about some of the case studies that were prepared by the Home Office for the Interception Commissioner to trot out. And I managed to track the original cases on which they were based and show that, frankly, the cases didn't, didn't demonstrate what they uh, apparently were suggested they should demonstrate. Um, and some cases, you know, in, in frankly risible fashion. So what was interesting about that, not that the Home Office cooked this up, one expects that, but the Interception Commissioner essentially was, was happy with that. And I was not really impressed with the Interception Commissioner, the last Interception Commissioner, we have a new one now, he was actually invited today. Uh, he had another engagement. Um, so the last Interception Commissioner, if the evidence is still available, frankly, was something like out of an evening comedy. Um, and the last, person, the last point I've forgotten, sorry. Okay. Look, I'm going to have to wrap this meeting up. Can, can I say how good it is that so many people have turned up to a meeting organised at such short notice? I think it shows how seriously this is taken out in the country. You clearly have a personal interest in this, and David and I hope to be talking to colleagues on all sides of the house to see both how we can both skill people up and improve their understanding of what laws govern this new technology, but also about what the future policy space should look like. I very much rely on the Open Rights Group to sort of be professional advisors on that. I hope that you are all members, or if not, you're on their database, if on their legal database, and if not, <laughs> please give us your details. <laughs> or even their illegal one, it's very useful. We went to laughing over there. So thank you for coming, and I hope you found the meeting as illuminating as we did. Yeah.